This week's episode of our show is sponsored by Dungeon Fog. This highly intuitive map making tool is perfect for dungeon masters looking to create gorgeous battle maps for their tabletop role playing games. We were blown away by how quickly we could create gorgeous homebrew battle maps using Dungeon Fog, from multi level dungeons to natural environments and more. You can finish all your prep work right in Dungeon Fog itself with its very powerful annotation and note taking tools, and then print the maps out to use at your tabletop export a high resolution image that you can import into a virtual tabletop or even connect dungeon fog to your tv or projector and use it with a fog of war mode right at the table a premium subscription gets you access to over 3,000 high resolution props textures and assets to add more detail to your maps with new assets being added every month follow the links in the description below or visit dungeonfog.com to try creating a new dungeon for your next game session and now, on to this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything Dungeons & Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos every Thursday, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are taking a look at five ways to run overland travel in your Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition campaigns. A lot of dungeon masters struggle with how overland travel might work in the setting that they are playing in. They often have questions about the resource management or foraging or when is a good time for random combat encounters. The answer to most of these questions depends on the type of campaign that you are trying to run. So today Monty and I are looking at five frameworks for you to use on how you might want to run overland travel in your setting. It all really boils down to one question and your answer to it. What is more important, the journey or the destination? There's a lot of ways to answer this question and a lot of ways to build your campaign around what your answer to this question is. So let's get rolling. Traveling can be a long, exhausting part of an adventure, and whether or not it is part of the adventure is going to be up to the world and the setting that you're creating. What parts of the journey can become an adventure for you and your players? What makes it exciting? Maybe there's locations along the way that are unexplored that the players can diverge from their main course to, to seek out, to find and uncover new treasures or clues that lead to the greater plot. Maybe they can meet interesting NPCs along the way or have combat encounters that actually tie in and foreshadow things that are coming up in the campaign. There's a lot of great things that you can add into an adventure, but the question is whether this is important to the setting and the story you're telling. Overland travel is a great way to build your Dungeons & Dragons world with your players. It communicates the scale and scope of how big the world is and makes it feel like a real and expansive place where what is beyond the next horizon is a mystery just waiting to be discovered. At the same time, overland travel, as far as the pacing of your adventure, can really bog down play especially when we add a lot of additional unnecessary mechanics or delay the pacing of the adventure and don't focus on the right parts of how we're structuring our adventure. Overplaying the travel time to get there can take away from that experience as your players get frustrated and be like, we just want to get there. Are we there yet? And in some other cases, jumping right in to the lost temple in the ancient jungles of the far-off continent downplays the remoteness and the specialness of how mysterious that place was. So striking the right balance between how much time it takes to get to the destinations in your campaign setting is the key, really, to figuring out how to run overland travel in your game. And that really boils down to the decision of, are you going to run travel in D&D in one of five ways. Fast travel mode. Travel in a single encounter. Travel as a single game session. Travel as an adventure arc. And travel as the entire campaign. So to get started, when we look at fast travel mode, this is for those of you who are creating a world where the destination is much more important 
than the journey. This is for the DMs who have a location that the players need to get to, and that is where all the exciting bits are going to occur. If this is the case, then your traveling should be non-existent and be left up to the DM to basically just set the scene with their words and paint a picture for the players on the world around them, the things they might see on their way, but then leave it at that and let them get into the meat of the adventure site that they are going to. Sometimes the best way to handle overland travel is to simply abbreviate it. Give a brief, one or two sentence description summarizing the journey and setting the scene. Don't have any dice rolls. Don't check for random encounters. Don't check to see if the players got lost. Don't worry about their supplies. Just get them there and tell them that they've arrived. A really good description will still communicate the scale and scope of the journey. Although this does work better for small tr bits of travel, such as moving through a city or through a settled area. I don't necessarily use this for a very long distance journey, but you could do that if the players are teleporting there. <laughs> This gives the players a lot of options to spark their imaginations for what the world feels and looks like, the different environments they might pass through, and where they are headed on their adventure. If you're more excited about what's going to happen at the adventure location itself, skip the boring bits, skip the travel, and get the players there. They will not notice, and they will not care, and your game will be better for it. The second option, which is treating travel as a single encounter, is the idea that if your characters are exploring something more interesting, a dangerous location that they have to get to somewhere within that dangerous location, you might want a single encounter that sets the stage for the environment that they are in. I like to think about this as room zero of the dungeon. This is what happens on the journey getting to the dungeon itself. The players have to cross a dangerous swamp, scale a cliff, find the forest temple in the midst of the lost woods, or complete some other task or puzzle or combat encounter that sets the scene in a more fleshed out and holistic way for the dungeon environment or location that they're going to be exploring. Again, this mentality of treating the travel scene as room zero of the whole dungeon really works quite effectively and allows you to meld it into the overall themes of the dungeon, maybe even foreshadowing what is going to be coming along by including a prominent monster that they're going to be encountering the, in the dungeon. Maybe the dungeon is filled with displacer beasts, so they encounter a displacer beast in the forest on their way. These sort of things help build out and maybe even provide an important clue that will help the players in the dungeon itself. You don't want to make this encounter a throwaway. You don't want to just pick random monsters and elements and toss them in for something for the party to do. If that's what you're doing, then it turns out that the journey isn't as important as the destination and you should move to the fast travel option. But what you want to do here is foreshadow. You want to tell part of the story. This is a great moment for you to use things like scouts or a hunting party from the location they're going to. Perhaps the party is traveling to a ruined temple in the forest, and what they don't know is that this temple is actually inhabited by vicious undead monsters. Having them run into a group of zombies or skeletons along the way to foreshadow that there are undead in the area paints the picture for them for when they get to the adventure site and they realize, oh, this is where the issue is stemming from. And it all ties into one story that you are trying to tell. It might not necessarily have to be a combat encounter either. You could instead have the player characters make a navigation encounter or a skill challenge where they encounter obstacles in the wilderness and have to survive through the threats and find their way to locate the area. Just remember to contain it within the confines of a single encounter so that you get right to the action and still set up the scene in an interesting way. If the traveling aspect is bigger than this, if they are traveling to a remote location in a hazardous environment, this is a great opportunity to implement traveling as an entire game session, allowing you to show the passage of time and the journey and the effort it takes to get to where they are going. In this model, you set up the travel, in fact, as its own sort of one-shot dungeon. Build one or two combat encounters, 
one or two exploration encounters, and one or two role-playing encounters that the players can have along the way to their journey. You can even build a branching path, like having the players decide whether they want to travel over the hazardous, avalanche-prone mountain pass, or dive down into the monster-infested underground mines. The idea with a game session like this is that you are going to start the session with the departure and end the session with their arrival. You want to be able to bridge all of that so that you end in a great place to start the next game with them at the dungeon location that you selected. When you have travel as a single game session, one of the problems that you run into is that the player characters might be spending several days traveling to their destination and they're only going to have one or two encounters each day. This means that they have the benefits of a long rest for every single encounter, meaning they can steamroll those, those encounters with their powerful abilities. This is where I like to implement a house rule that Kelly and I have created called the travel weariness rule. And what this rule states is that after any day where a player character spends four or more hours traveling, it takes 24 hours for them to gain the benefits of a long rest. What this does is it means that it now is a much bigger commitment and increases the travel time by a lot in order for the players to get to point A to point B if they're resting every single day. And so this means that if they have a week-long journey, the players now have a choice. You can take two weeks to get there and be well-rested every single day, or you can take only a week to get there, but you're going to have to use the resources of a single adventuring day over the course of the entire journey, which makes the whole journey feel a lot more difficult and challenging. Dungeons and Dragons makes pretty light of the fact that traveling in heavy armor on horseback for five days on end is relatively okay in the worlds of D&D. If we want to make the journey part of the adventure, then we want to implement a way that traveling feels more exhausting and it doesn't allow the characters to be able to bolster themselves up every night when they rest on the road. A 12-hour flight is brutal, but so is an 8-hour drive. And where you have the advantage of modern technologies, comforts, and an awesome road trip soundtrack for that. If you imagine just how brutal it would be to walk for 8 hours straight in a single day, you can understand where the feeling and thoughts of this house rule come from. And it has a great effect on the overall mechanics of the adventure structure. By saying that after several consecutive days of travel, it takes the player characters several days to gain the benefits of a rest, it reflects just how exhausting travel is in real life, but it also makes the challenges that the players face over the couple days of travel more meaningful because they can't just take a long rest naturally every night and go into each one of those combat encounters and bomb it out with their most powerful abilities and spells. They have to treat it overall like an entire single day of adventuring, which makes it a much bigger challenge. Next up, we come to the concept of travel as an adventure arc. This is where you are going to spend multiple game sessions telling the story of the journey from point A to point B. If this is the case, this means that the journey is, in fact, just as important as the other aspects of your campaign world. This is great for if you have a large spanning adventure where they have to travel from one point of the continent to the other. This could also be a journey through a dangerous location for months on end, where every day could be a threat to the party. This is where you want to pull in a lot of the options for how to manage your resources in overland travel and make the party really feel like traveling through this area is a threat and a danger to them. When you are doing travel as an adventure arc, this is where you want to bring in your awesome tracking tools like a calendar and a map so the player characters can see their progress but also see how long it's taking them to get to their destination. Using these very mundane tracking elements is sometimes enough and you might not even need to get into the things like tracking food and water and other resources which by and large player characters in Dungeons and Dragons if you've got a ranger or a druid in your party they're not going to have a lot of trouble foraging for food or casting goodberry or create food and water to get the resources that they need. I don't think that D&D &D does a very good job of 
capturing the survivalist feeling overall, I make the adventure arc built out of several various sessions. So I use this part of the travel is going across the mountain range. This is going across the forest. This is going through the underdark. This is traveling through the forest or the jungle again. This is the stop off in the city. And I use the conceits of the single game session just strung together. And this means that the party might even hit key milestones and level up as they go through the, the journey overall. It's also important to note that even if they are traveling through one type of location, the big jungle, you can still break this up into different areas. What is in the jungle? Perhaps day one, they stumble upon an old ruined fort that has enemies hiding in it. The next day, there is a gorge with a old rickety bridge across it. Just coming up with thematic ways to separate each of the legs of the adventure really allows the players to feel like it is different enough to keep their interest and intrigue for multiple sessions. Yeah, if you are spending multiple game sessions devoted to the same general type of travel, having the player characters just roll to see if they get lost, roll to see if they run out of food, and then rolling for random encounters that you pulled from a giant table, this really is hard to make interesting. And so the best way to solve it is to not run your travel like that and build it based on this mentality of dungeons as travel and using those branching paths and then stringing them together. Another great way that you can make this adventure interesting is by using conflicts or touchstones or events that actually carry on with the party. Maybe there's a reoccurring villain or a caravan or a sailing vessel that they are part of. They need to get to know NPCs. They need to travel with them, protect them, or deliver them somewhere. Make quests and elements of this adventure that allow them to feel like there is growth and change throughout it. One final way to really make this whole thing come to life is to put a time limit or a clock on the overall journey. The party has 30 days to reach their destination. If they don't get there in time, their quest will fail completely. And you can be completely transparent with the players about how much time they have to reach their final destination. And this works really, really well, especially when you combine it with the travel weariness rule. Because now the decision of will the players rest is a decision about strategic resources and managing their time in an interesting way. If the player characters know that taking a rest is going to take them 24 hours, they've got a long journey to cover that's going to spend several game sessions, and they only have two weeks to get to their destination, well then they're going to be much more careful about how many long rests they take over the course of the adventure, and they might stretch their resources a little bit thin. This yields to some really interesting gameplay and turns the entire overland travel adventure into a bit of a marathon or a race, which is an excellent model to create and drive conflict in the adventure. Lastly, we come to travel as a campaign arc. This is where the entire point of the campaign is about getting there. The greatest example would be the Lord of the Rings, which is all about our characters getting to where they need to go with the magic item that they have to dispose of it. Look at all the incredible locations that Tolkien explored in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings books. This is about the scale of how many different locations you need to travel through when you are having travel as the campaign arc. It's really important to explore multiple different and very diverse and interesting locations in order to keep that fresh and interesting. The whole point of having travel as a campaign arc is to really do that world tour sort of feeling of spending a couple game sessions in the mountains, a couple in the forest, a couple traveling across the ocean, and more and more. And you really have this diversity of locations that communicate the scope and scale of the overall adventure. You really want to consider the same tools that we used for the travel as an adventure arc and implement them multiple times for adventure as a campaign arc. Break it into the sections between each of the key locations along the journey. 
maybe they're not prominent dungeons or parts of the story, but what sort of ruins or mysteries might the players come across while they're trying to get from point A to point B? What cities will they rest in or stop at and meet people and engage with NPCs? What clues or secrets might they uncover on their journey? What rumors might they hear that might lead them off course to other locations that could be really interesting to them? Reward this sort of play and really explore the sort of environments and places that they might go. By implementing the rules multiple times, such as using the adventure idea or even using multiple doom clocks or the travel weariness option, if you're implementing all of these, you're going to have a bigger range on the types of things that can happen within your campaign, which is about the journey. When you are running your entire campaign as a travel-based campaign, sometimes it is important to throw in a dungeon crawl and a site-based adventure where the players can really get to explore one of those individual locations. Sometimes your player characters will also need downtime when they'll be able to stop off in a port or a major city or a rest stop and recuperate for a couple days to roleplay with NPCs and talk about the next steps of their journey. Keeping the big goal in mind, you know, what is the final destination on the horizon? Is it about getting to Mount Doom? Is it about finding El Dorado? Is it about completing the pilgrimage? Is it about opening up the new trade routes? Those big ideas should always be present in the campaign, but when you are running travel as an entire campaign, it's important to use multiple clocks and put a pause on that clock here and there so the players can actually bask and enjoy parts of that world. Keep in mind that if you are running travel as a full campaign arc, you might be thinking that it's important to include things like foraging or downtime or... Um, survival or finding camping locations or hunting for your food or water but you want to talk to your players about how interested they are in this aspect of the game because for a lot of players this can actually be a very dull part of Dungeons and Dragons and with all the spells and tools at their disposal it can actually peter off pretty early on in the campaign and become virtually irrelevant. So the question is how important is it to you as the DM and how interested are your players in engaging with that aspect? As the player characters level up they gain access to spells like Phantom Steed, Liaman's Tiny Hut, Mordenkainen's Magnificent Mansion, Rope Trick, Teleportation Circle, Plane Shift, Air Walk. These spells can make an entire journey that might otherwise take in months or years happen in the blink of an eye. And they start to really come online as players get to around 9th, 10th, and by 15th level, the player characters will find overland travel very, very easy to accomplish with a couple spells. So this is where a campaign built around mundane overland travel really is at its best between the earliest levels of the game and it starts to run into problems with the character's abilities by around 9th and 10th level and by 15th level the ship has sailed on overland travel and it's time to start focusing on planar travel and the really big ideas of the D&D multiverse. So make sure that if you are planning that overland travel campaign get it while the getting's good because the journey does come to an end in D&D 5e as soon as the players get that teleport spell. So this has been a look at five ways to run overland travel in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. If you have any tips or tricks that have improved your experience with overland travel, tell us about them in the comments below. The videos we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the amazing generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work that we create here on YouTube, please consider checking us out on Patreon by following the links in the description below or at patreon.com slash dungeon underscore dudes. Don't forget to check out our live play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash dungeon underscore dudes. You can find all the previous episodes from those campaigns right up over here. And we have plenty more tips and tricks for Dungeon Masters running D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in the dungeon.